to our title. As you can see, it's not exactly the same as what we advertised. Uh, Augusto wasn't able to make it, and I think our talk was going to be slightly overambitious for 20 minutes. So I'm just going to be talking about Scotland today, and not about Canada. But you can ask me about Canada uh, later if you want. Um, we're also going to be shifting gears with this talk. So uh, we've, we've heard some talks about uh, politics and rurality in the present. Uh, and I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about the past. Um, so in this paper, what I want to do is to share some thoughts on rural experience emanating from a collaborative project between the University of Aberdeen and a local community group known as the Baileys of Benahi. Um, now what we've been doing is looking into the archaeology and, and history of what is known as the colony site. Um, the colony site being a 19th century <laughs> informal uh, settlement situated on the flanks of northeast Scotland's uh, perhaps most famous landmark, uh, the Hill of Benihi. Let's see if we, yes, there's Benihi showing up nicely there uh, and the location of the colony site. So let me just start off with a little bit of background. Um, now, records suggest that the Benihi <coughs> colony was founded in the early 19th century in a context of, of really massive uh, land reform, agricultural improvement. Uh, where rationalized farming practices and, and high rents effectively produced a large surplus population of what were often landless wage laborers. Now, a lot of people ended up getting attracted to cities like Aberdeen, places like, Aber uh, like um, Edinburgh and Glasgow. This is when these large Victorian cities grow. They're absorbing lots of folks uh, from rural parts of, of Scotland. Um, but lots of the itinerant who were squeezed off the land decided to actually stay put in some of these rural areas in, in the lowlands. This talk specifically talking about the, the northeast of Scotland, which is a lowland landscape, not a highland landscape, for those that might have uh, thoughts of the highlands in their mind. Um, there were a range of different peripheral areas that people could move into. Wasteland, for example, other unoccupied land. And Benihi was, was a, a sort of a category of, of unoccupied land, effectively a form of commonty or a common land, uh, which was used by surrounding communities uh, to furnish a, a wealth of, of different types of natural resources, such as peat and building stone. Uh, and it also became sought after, of course, by those who were sort of squeezed off the land elsewhere. So they were able to put down roots on this so-called wasteland. Now, by the 1840s and 1850s, an extensive crofting community had colonized the hill's lower slopes, uh, and these folks survived by subsistence farming and also by selling their labor to uh, local estates. Uh, crucially, because they weren't paying rent, uh, they were able to uh, establish a, a fairly populous community uh, and a, a kind of a, a classic uh, crofting sort of a signature where you're practicing subsistence, agriculture, sell your, selling your labor, a bit of a jack of all trades, if you like. Now, 1859 was a watershed year for the 70 or so individuals that were actually living on the hill at this time, because it was in this year that it was controversially appropriated by the neighboring Balquine estate. Uh, and following this onerous improvement style tenancies uh, were imposed on the land, which uh, led to a number of, of evictions. Now, if rent didn't quite spell the end to the colony, then the depression of the 1870s and 1880s and the drying up of agricultural farm work certainly did. And by the end of the century, uh, the settlement was all but abandoned. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, of, of small abandoned settlements like this in Scotland. So what makes the colony so special? Uh, this is just an artist's uh, impression uh, of the colony uh, done by uh, the Baileys of Benihi, or actually contracted to an artist by the Baileys of Benihi. So why bother with this? As I, as I mentioned, there's lots of, of, of sites of this nature. What makes uh, the colony so special? Well, Benihi's conspicuous physical presence means that it has tended to loom large within the lives of, of people in the Northeast. Um, it's therefore not surprising that with the colony's arrival, it became a target for a variety of writers and, and commentators who singled out its, its perceived failings. Um, we need to understand that in a historical context where social acceptability was rooted in land ownership, 
uh, in legal tenancies and the trappings of, of economic and, and social improvement um, that um, effectively what, what's going on here is that um, you know, these people are not showing these kinds of things uh, and that you know, there's a certain identity that's being imposed on the colonists that, that emphasized their primitive and marginal nature, the marginal nature of their existence. Uh, and these writers tend to highlight the colonists' sort of humble dwellings, their apparent refusal to engage in, in modern agricultural methods, and they tend to kind of vilify them uh, as an exotic race of, of mountain people sometimes, um, or at worst, licentious squatters and thieves in certain cases. Um, had the uh, literary critic Raymond Williams' uh, Country in the City trained its literary criticism on Scotland, uh, he might have suggested that such pronouncements simply served to normalize the class relations of capitalism that were slowly being sewn into the fabric of the rural uh, life of the Northeast. So the colony was backwards and everyone knew it. But was this really the case? Was it really this simple? Um, now, as all historical archaeologists know, uh, know, those who write history, uh, particularly when they have technologies like uh, the printing press in their service, have a significant share of the responsibility for creating class-based stereotypes, which uh, can often homogenize those at the bottom without power, without a voice. Um, we can think about how terms like commoners are reserved for the face of, faceless pool of, of servile wage laborers. Uh, even worse, words like squatters are singled out for those who take without respecting the prevailing social order. Uh, instead of assuming the social labeling that, that have been imposed by outsiders, uh, as we can see within this literature, uh, part of our work at the colony has sought to understand uh, whether the colonists were actually really so different uh, from other members of the rural wage laboring majority, particularly in terms of how they engaged with the guiding principles of, of improvement. Now, at the same time, while it might be one thing to challenge the settled identities of class-based literature by insisting on, on fluidity, for example, as much current historical archaeology is apt to do, um, we also wish to make a particular stand, like the geographer Doreen Massey does, about the need to clearly identify contexts where temporary stabilities are achieved in the way that people relate to each other and the way they relate to things which ultimately suppress or highlight different kinds of social distinctions and ultimately different social worlds. Now the context that we focused on at Banahi relate to two potentially conflicting social arenas, uh, things that emphasized sharing and, and communal relations, and also things that emphasized the colonists, colonists as, as, as individuals. So the result is, is something akin to a, a kind of a micro-history uh, of the colony, if you like. Right, so I want to begin uh, with a scale of analysis that speaks to the notion of a shared or, or a communal landscape. Um, the colony, as you can see on the map that we've drawn, is, is spread over an area of approximately 100 acres, and it's composed of at least uh, nine ruined crofts uh, made up of dwelling houses, outbuildings, and kale yards. Uh, which are set within enclosed and, and partly enclosed fields. Now, at this scale, it's possible to identify um, key features that help us to address questions about the uniqueness of the community, uh, particularly the more popular charge of its sort of marginal slash backwards uh, nature. Now, when combined with historical sources, it provides us with some important evidence about how the material conditions of life shaped community relations on the hillside. Now, across the colony, we find a common commitment to organizing the built environment. Um, this is a, a picture of Essen's Croft, so one of the crofts on the hillside. Um, crofts were cleared of stone, uh, as we can see through the construction of so-called consumption dikes. Um, and at the same time, stone was used to make enclosed fields, just like the, the photograph here. Also things like animal pens uh, and trackways while well, elaborate stone wells were constructed around certain water courses. Now in places, the craftsmanship of these features is as well preserved as it is unexpected. Um, walls can be built with often enviable symmetry, often exhibiting expertly mounted capstones, 
Um, a reminder, perhaps, that the colonists were actually renowned as, as champion dikers. Um, and although turf, turf construction was still uh, common in some highland areas in the 19th century, uh, the cottages on Benihi were made of undressed granite. Uh, they had gable and fireplaces, uh, and they were built on uh, leveled stances. Um, from our perspective, uh, rather than the sort of hovels of, of kind of popular accounts, the, the houses actually look uh, remarkably like other solidly built uh, crofting households uh, known from the region more broadly. Now, the built environment can only really tell us so much. So to get a better handle on whether the colonists were improving their fields or not, uh, we've also turned to archaeological science techniques. Um, and here my, my colleague, uh, Karen Millick, has been invaluable. Karen has uh, come into the project along with the help of students and, of course, our collaborators, the Baileys of Benihi. Uh, and they've recently carried out uh, soil sampling at three different farmsteads, uh, farms that we call Shepherd's Lodge, Hillside, and, and Burnside. Now, these locations are starting to reveal a, a story of, of anthropogenic uh, inputs to the colony environment that begin to contradict some of the accounts about the sort of apparent backwardness of the colonists and their, and their miserable attempts to kind of scratch a living from the hillside. Uh, we've dug test pits uh, across kale yards, effectively kitchen gardens, across fields, uh, and also unimproved land as well on the outskirts of, of the colony. And this has demonstrated really sort of marked uh, differences in soil types. So test pits just outside the enclosed fields um, look a little bit like that, the picture on the bottom. Um, they are incredibly thin soils, uh, very, very shallow, waterlogged for much of the year, and they would have been completely unsuitable for crop growth without drainage and, and artificially uh, thickening. Now, in contrast, um, soil test pits excavated inside enclosed fields uh, demonstrate clear evidence of, of improvement. You know, I've got a picture of the uh, one of the kale yards up on the, on the slide there. Um, now, all of the agricultural fields were composed of plowed topsoils containing uh, hearth and midden waste, uh, and these had been deepened through plowing to depths of, of uh, so, uh, over a meter in certain places. Uh, and in the kale yards, soils were actually thickened by the addition of, of peat until they reached uh, depths of, of almost a meter. Um, we've only done this to three crofts, uh, but uh, the suggestion is that this is a uh, uh, something that we could roll out elsewhere, and, and we think we're going to find uh, similar kinds of results. Uh, so I think these results are beginning to kind of cast doubt on, on this notion of uh, the colonists, uh, you know, scratching a living from the hillside, that the sort of caricatures of rustic living that were sometimes applied to these folk. Now, this is not to deny that the community faced significant challenges or that some uh, older, more antiquated methods of, of farming were used. Uh, such as uh, the use of, of narrow rigs, uh, which were actually advantageous for drainage, and in fact, in many parts of Scotland, were used right up into the 20th century in certain highland areas. Um, but it does begin to provide a much broader appreciation of the significant labor uh, that was actually expended uh, on the hill. Now, although each family inhabited and in improved a single croft, it's almost unthinkable that labor on this scale was not to some degree a sort of a cooperative affair. Uh, in fact, according to parish records, we know that uh, many of the families intermarried or had informal relationships, uh, which not only produced children, but of course social and economic obligations. In fact, it's not too difficult uh, to suggest that much of the work that, that um, we've described was actually carried out uh, through the help of neighbors in a sort of a reciprocal fashion, not uncommon in settler communities. Um, across upland Britain, uh, in fact, uh, community building of, of a so-called one-night house over the course of a, of a single evening was said to provide informal settler communities with a degree of tacit legitimacy. In fact, uh, one source remarks on the very practice at Banihi, describing how neighbors uh, joined together and in one day built a house for a, a quote-unquote squatter, uh, celebrating the event with, with a supper in the same evening in the newly erected building. Now, such practices were likely important, not only for creating shared experience of working the land, but also uh, in helping to forge uh, social connections across this landscape. 
Okay, so at the landscape scale that I focused on so far, it's easy to, to sort of paint a relatively homogeneous picture of the colony in a way that I think much class-based history is also guilty. Um, but what appears as a neatly framed image at one level of detail begins to lose some of its sharpness at another. Um, closer attention to the architectural history of individual crofts, for example, begins to reveal that people were, were caught up with notions of improvement in very different ways, um, which points, I think, to an important degree of, of dissonance within the colony that doesn't necessarily sit comfortably alongside the inclination to generalize. Now, a quick glance at the survey plans that we've produced shows that while there are uh, many aspects of similarity, there are also important differences uh, between crofts. This is not a fantastic shot. I promise to get a better one for the next uh, talk that I do. Uh, but we can see that uh, with the farmsteads, uh, we've got different sizes, some with larger or, or smaller dwellings. Uh, we've got presence or absence of outbuildings. We've got different arrangements of buildings. Uh, we can compare, for example, and I don't have a, a picture of this, uh, the relatively rectilinear character of Shepherd's Lodge, uh, which seems to kind of respect the geometry of, of improvement agriculture, with the seemingly makeshift layout of a croft that we refer to as A-frame, uh, with its series of haphazardly placed and wandering curvilinear enclosures, uh, much more reminiscent of very small garden plots and animal pens uh, than they are of arable fields. Now, given these differences, in the summer of, of 2013, we decided to undertake an excavation of two of the more interesting sites, uh, Shepherd's Lodge and Hillside, I've got them marked there on the slide, uh, so that we could compare their respective holdings. So what did we find? Well, uh, both farms outwardly show improvement features such as stances uh, built into the hillside and, and lime mortar construction, but a closer reading of the archaeological evidence also reveals some interesting differences. Let's look at Hillside, first of all. The McDonald family of Hillside, who were the latecomers to the colony, appeared to have remodeled an older, simpler croft to take advantage of certain modern conveniences, uh, notably implementing a clear separation between the business end of the farm and domestic spaces. Uh, the working end is centered on a U-shaped steading and contains uh, a substantial courtyard, buyer, cart shed, and animal pens, well, the house has its back to the courtyard and faces the more salubrious kale yard. Uh, an interesting feature here is the stonework uh, of the courtyard itself, a finely cobbled pavement uh, of an unexpected level of craftsmanship for the colony. Uh, in fact, this feature undoubtedly kept the crofters' feet out of the muck, but more importantly, it also reveals a broader set of issues, such as an awareness of hygiene and the aesthetics of improved farming. Uh, both with clear links to notions of, of social decorum. I think similar principles would have led to the enclosing of the trackway at Hillside, which funnels traffic well away from the dwelling threshold. Now, in contrast, uh, what we have uh, at Shepherd's Lodge, um, where, the, where the Little Johns were living, uh, they seem to have been contented to share the threshold of their house, or the entranceway of their house, with a variety of both animal and, and human traffic, because the forecourt area of the house also forms the main trackway across the hill uh, in this part of the settlement. And that's the, that's the courtyard area I'm talking about, the kale yard here, the salubrious view out across the, uh, across the kale yard. Um, now what stands out at Shepherd's Lodge is how the building seems to closely echo the fertility of the Little John family as it increased in numbers between 1830 and 18, uh, the 1870s, which we know from census information, and, and effectively spread its influence over Banihi, notably through intermarriage. Uh, now, as you can see on the slide here, uh, the multiple rooms uh, sequentially abut an original single-celled uh, structure, uh, suggesting that the cottage expanded into a much larger four-celled range structure, including at least two separate apartments, uh, a possible storage room and a cart shed to accommodate the ever-growing Little John family. So we've got the original dwelling house here and it's expanding out that way. Now, the excavation of the uh, dwelling interiors at the sites uh, revealed additional contrasts. 
The McDonald House had a relatively spacious floor plan consistent with a, a spacious two-room dwelling with a cobbled floor. Thank you. It had uh, three windows, two facing the kale yard and one facing uh, the courtyard, the latter helping to light a profitable hallway uh, separating the rooms. Well, in the north room, we uncovered an ample uh, gable end uh, built fireplace. Now, this was uh, composed of a V-shaped stone firebox uh, flanked by cheek stones, all of which sat on a substantial stone flag, uh, flagged hearth. Now, finally, the, the entire construction rested on stone-built foundations. Uh, so with these observations in mind, it's not difficult to suggest that we might be dealing with a modern pattern book house, as these were becoming popular across Aberdeenshire at the time. Uh, at the very least, Hillside is a dwelling inspired by these kinds of innovations. Uh, now, in contrast, despite its numerous occupants, uh, Shepherd's Lodge reveals a smaller, slightly less regular structure. Uh, here, the walls rested directly on the topsoil, and there was no evidence for a built floor. Uh, finally, it also had a much smaller, triangular, uh, knee-shaped fireplace. So, what does it all mean? Well, at the very least, we're seeing very different levels of planning and execution linked to the capacities of the former occupants as they responded uh, to what was possible within a world that imposed certain limits. Uh, differences in form and function of built spaces were likely associated with the ways in which uh, the crofters uh, viewed each other. Almost certainly, reputations would have hinged on maintaining appearances, such as keeping the family properly sheltered, clothed, uh, and fed. And records indicate that uh, Little John Sr. was by turns a laborer, a diker, a stonemason, a shepherd, and at the end of his life, a pauper. Uh, an eclectic life, to be sure, that, that dabbled in both opportunities and hardships. Uh, by the 1870s, the household provided a roof over the heads of at least 10 documented individuals, including tenants and a number of illegitimate grandchildren. Um, a cottage heaving with bodies is, is not an outlandish uh, image, I think, for 19th century Britain. However, the contrast with the carefully planned presentation um, and pedigree of Hillside with its socially sanctioned improvements and only three mouths to feed may have been fuel for the colony gossip mill. Uh, while the McDonald's were relative newcomers, they farmed the biggest patch at seven acres, the owned livestock, and could po uh, point uh, to the head of the family's former career in business. Uh, John McDonald was, in fact, a retired contractor. So the overall pattern is one of subtle discontinuities of, of family histories with different pathways and changing circumstances. So just to briefly summarize, we cannot deny that the colonists experience a range of hardships which might be used to reinforce certain discourses about rural poverty and those that witness the sharp end of transformations in the age of capitalism. Um, however, our research has begun to establish a rich and unexpected tapestry uh, of life on this apparently marginal land. Uh, while the colonists were certainly victims of popular representations of poverty, what social anthropologist Maya Green calls an identity of form rather than content, attempts to classify its residents as, as mountain people, rural poor, or even squatters begins to look a little superficial once we begin to start to uh, assemble the range of evidence at our disposal. Uh, a collaborative approach following, following various, various lines of questioning allows for interpretations that are multi-scalar and hopefully more richly textured. The, the colony was a, a result of wider improvement processes, but it was also an example of how improvement ideas were locally adopted, resisted, or adapted. Uh, these were material relations that played directly into the way community relations were themselves negotiated. Uh, and so our conclusion suggests that rural lifeways must be carefully contextualized. And as ever, uh, the devil is in the detail. Uh, sorry that I overran there. Uh, those of you that are interested, um, we have uh, recently produced a publication on this in the International Journal of Historical Archaeology. And finally, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of people that I have to thank. Um, I'm not the only one here. I'm just reading out the script effectively. So lots of people involved in this project. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.